Jonas Luscher was born in Bern, Switzerland. After completing his primary school teacher training, he worked for several years in the film industry in Munich. In 2005, he began studying philosophy while working as a freelance editor. He spent a year as visiting researcher at the Stanford University Comparative Literature Department. Jonas Lischer is now completing his doctoral work at the ETH in Zurich on the importance of narrative in describing complex social problems in the context of Richard Rorty's neo-pragmatism. Barbarian Spring, his first novel, was nominated for both the German Book Prize and the Swiss Book Prize. In 2013, he was awarded the Bern Literature Prize, the Bavarian Arts Prize for Literature, and the Franz Hessel Prize. Um, this, the book is available in English, and there are even a few copies here. It's, it's a fabulous novel, so please snap them up before they go. Um, and then order them from your independent bookstore as well. <laughs> so as intimidating as Jonas's philosophical work sounds, he is an equally impressive storyteller. In Barbarian Spring, he uses these considerable skills to, divide, to describe several complex social problems of the day like the seamy underside of globalization and the fallout of unfettered capitalism. But he doesn't just go after the obvious targets. He also skewers the 0.1% who, just because they don't have to make day-to-day -day decisions, can pride themselves on having clean hands. In this novel, Prizing, the wealthy Swiss owner of an international telecommunications firm is sent to C Tunisia by his CEO, ostensibly to meet with suppliers and have a vacation, but actually so that he won't interfere with running the business. Prizing ends up at a luxury desert resort where a group of rich, young London bankers are celebrating a lavish wedding. During the wedding night, the British pound collapses, leaving almost all the guests trapped and destitute with tragicomic results. As an avowed cultural relativist, Prizing watches the mayhem play out across the social and economic spectrum with polite, composed neutrality. Until, that is, the rumbling aftershocks of the Arab Spring shake his world, and he has to face just how many dirty hands his wealth depends on. The, um, the translator is Peter Lewis, and um, so I will have the reading. Thank you, Tess. I'm going to read from the second chapter. Es war also jene englische Lehrerin Pippa Grayling, die Preising in die Gästestruktur des Resorts einweihte. Ein Vorgang, den er mit einem kurzen Zitat zur Kristallisation der Gesellschaft in jenem kleinen deutschen Badeort, in dem die Strzebatskis zur Kur verweilt hatten, kommentierte. Was Pippa und Preising verband, war der Umstand, dass sie sich beide nicht aus freien Stücken für das Thousand and One Night entschieden hatten. Sie war hier, weil ihr Sohn beschlossen hatte, seine Hochzeit in einem tunesischen Oasenresort zu feiern und zu diesem Zweck 70 Freunde und Familienmitglieder hatte einfliegen lassen. Es war, so berichtete Pippa, ihre Irritation nicht verbergend, das, was man sich als junges, in der City tätiges Paar unter einer standesgemessen Hochzeit vorstellte. Ihr Sohn Mark und seine frisch angetraute Frau Kelly bildeten also das Kernstück jener großen Gruppe, die Preising bereits am Pool aufgefallen war. Junge Leute in ihren späten Zwanzigern und frühen Dreißigern, laut und selbstsicher, schlank und durchtrainiert. Die Männer trugen sandfarbene Chinos, Polohemden und Mokassins. Die Frauen Tanktops und enge Shorts, aus denen braun gebrannte, seidige Beine ragten. Pedikürte, zarte Füße steckten in Flipflops. Wer sich ins Wasser wagte, trug eine jener Badehosen, wie man sie von Fotos kannte, die den jungen JFK am Strand von Martha's Winyard zeigten. Oder knappe Bikinis, die die flachen Bäuche gut zur Geltung brachten und die Intimrasur rechtfertigten. Selbst nahezu nackt wirkten sie wie in Uniform. Preising stieß auf dem ganzen Areal auf kleine Grüppchen von ihnen. Sie standen witzereißend an einer der Bars. Sie verschwanden, sich ungestüm küssend und sich die Hände gegenseitig unter die Bünde ihre engen, Sch engen Shorts steckend in ihren klimatisierten Zelten. Sie erteilten dem Personal selbstliche Anweisungen. Sie wanderten fluchend durch die Palmenhaine auf der Suche nach besserem Empfang für ihre Blackberries. Denn ihre Gehälter rechtfertigten, dass man von ihnen verlangen konnte, immer und überall erreichbar zu sein. Preising war sowieso erstaunt, dass in diesen Tagen der Londoner Finanzplatz 50 junge Talente entbehren konnte. Aber vielleicht, dachte er, war ohnehin nichts mehr zu retten und so hatten sie sich hierher selbst gerettet. 
Eine Vorstellung, die Preising recht amüsant fand und mit der Pipa zu erheitern schien, ihr aber auch ein verächtliches Schnauben entlockte, welches er einen erschreckten Augenblick auf sich selbst bezog, bevor er erleichtert begriff, dass das der Bagage am südlichen Ende des Pools galt. Vielen Dank. It was the English teacher, Pippa Grayling, then, who initiated prizing into the social standing of the various guests at the desert resort. When he recounted it to me, he tossed in an apposite quotation from Anna Karenina, which summarized the social hierarchy in that little German spa where the Scherbatskys go for a rest cure. What really made Pippa and prizing click straight away was the fact that they were both at the Thousand and One Nights under duress. She was here because her son had decided to hold his wedding at a Tunisian oasis resort, flying in no fewer than 70 friends and family members. That, Pippa explained, making no attempt to hide her irritation, was what a young couple who both worked in the city imagined passed for a society wedding. Her son Mark and his bride-to-be Kelly formed the nucleus of that large group whom Prizing had already seen gathered around the pool young people in their late 20s or early 30s, brash and self-confident, trim and gym-toned. The men sported sand-colored chinos, polo shirts and moccasins, and the women tank tops and figure-hugging shorts over golden tanned, silky smooth legs, flip-flops on their dainty manicured feet. Those who opted for a dip in the pool were wearing the kind of swimming trunks familiar from old photos of JFK on the beach at Martha's Vineyard, or simply or skimpy bikinis that showed off flat stomachs to best effect and justified the Brazilian they had done before coming away. Even in the state of near nakedness, though, they all looked like they were in uniform. Prizing kept running into little knots of them all over the complex. He'd encountered them standing around one of the bars, cracking jokes, or disappearing, snogging furiously and groping each other under the waistbands of their tight shorts into their climate-controlled tents, or ordering the staff around imperiously and stomping their way through the palm grove, cursing as they searched for better reception for their blackberries. After all, their salaries were such as to require that they should be contactable wherever they were, 24-7. Prizing was astonished that the city could spare 50 of its young guns in the present climate. Maybe, he thought, the game was up already and they'd taken refuge here. Prizing was tickled by this idea and shared it with Pippa to try and cheer her up. But all it elicited was a contemptuous snort, which for one alarming moment he thought might be directed at him, until he realized with relief that she was gazing at the rabble who'd assembled around the southern end of the pool. The social gradient, as she put it, started at the northern end. That was where Kelly's brothers and sisters, who'd also been invited, had withdrawn to with their children. The kids, in loud patterned trunks, kept hurling themselves into the pool and clamoring out again, over and over, hollering and shrieking all the while. Perched on the edge, their mothers were annoyed by the incessant splashing which had wrinkled the pages of the women's magazines they were reading. After a few failed attempts to fraternize with the city boys, Kelly's brother Willie, his chest turning red from the Tunisian sun, had taken refuge in a large yellow swimming ring, where, with the aid of a couple of bottles of Heineken, He now lay basking and trying to fathom how he should be feeling vis-a-vis -vis the luxury surrounding him, for which he had his sister and new brother-in-law entirely to thank, and which he'd never been able to afford for his family off his own bat. He'd made it through the first day with an overwhelming sense of revulsion. That had given way to a studied serenity. Different world, he thought, even a different planet, planet of the apes. He really did find them apish, too, the young people at the far end of the pool. The young ones, his private name for them, though in fact they were all much the same age as him. Then again, what did they know about the real world? He had three kids to provide for, and he liked his swimming trunks with the tattoo pattern. My husband, Pippa told Prizing, only went to the pool once, just long enough to formulate the theory that with this generation, you can tell people's incomes from the color of their swimming trunks. According to him, the more garish they were, the more likely their owner was to be in the red. Sanford's a sociologist, you see, she added apologetically. In fact, Pippa had really been hoping she might get to know Kelly's parents a bit better here, 
and she hardly knew them. But Mary and Kenneth Ibbotson had found it hard making the transition from Liverpool to Chub, or maybe from their respective roles as a shop steward in a machine tool factory and a housewife to the bride's parents at a 250,000 pound wedding and were spending most of the time holed up in their air-conditioned tent. It was plain to see, Prizing impressed on me, that Pippa was unhappy. Unhappy with her son's choice of career and his social circle, and with the fact that this wedding was being held in a Tunisian luxury resort. But she had a friendly nature and a sharp mind and put a brave face on her unhappiness. Still, I couldn't help but observe social convention and offer my warmest congratulations on her son getting married. She thanked me with a small, ironic laugh. In fact, he went on, it was me who spoiled the cheerful atmosphere by asking if Mark was her only child or whether she'd had to go through all these elaborate wedding preparations several times before. No, she replied. Mark was her only child, at least the only surviving one. Her elder daughter, Laura, had been killed three years ago, just off the North Cape of Norway in the bowels of a Herta Gruten cruise ship in which she'd been working as a librarian. Incinerated, Pippa continued, along with a couple of hundred Scandinavian crime novels and the complete works of Stendhal, which a faulty fan heater had set alight. The manner in which she described her daughter's death surprised me. It was like she was standing in a bar and regaling people with an anecdote about how she'd come by a particularly impressive scar or lost the tip of one of her fingers. But perhaps that's actually what it was like for her like the loss of a body part or an amputation as the result of a grotesque accident. For someone like me who had never had kids, Prising said, it's hard to imagine what it means to lose a child. <laughs>